Welcome to episode 5 of our series on travels of Ibn Battuta. In this episode, we'll look into Ibn Battuta's journey through the Arabian lands to fulfill his Hajj's religious obligation. The Quran, Surah 3 states. The first house established for the people was that at, Mecca, a place holy and guidance to all beings. Therein are clear signs, the station of Abraham, and whosoever enters it is in security. All men towards God must come to the house of pilgrim if he is able to make his way there. If you've not completed our previous episode, we suggest you do so before starting today's episode and with that said, let's dive into today's episode. Ibn Battuta gives no sign of the number of individuals such as himself who were gathering in Damascus in 1326 to join the Hajj caravan to Mecca, yet it was likely a few thousand. Each member was obliged to get arrangements for the full circle, just as a mount. However, Mamluk specialists set up magnanimous assets to provide food and creatures to the most unfortunate among the pilgrims. Except if a traveler conveyed the majority of his provisions alongside him the excursion could end up being incredibly costly. Ibn Battuta himself was in dire financial straits toward the end of his stay in Damascus and might not have been able to set out that year had it not been for the Maliki jurist's generosity with whom he stayed while he was sick. This gentleman, Ibn Battuta tells us in the Rila, hired camels for me and gave me traveling provisions, etc., and money also, saying to me, it will come in useful for anything of importance that you may be in need of, may God reward him. The yearly appearance of the Hajj trains at Mecca was an event for the Sharif, called the Emir, to reaffirm, through a trade of blessings and accolade, his allegiance to the ruler and his acknowledgement of Mamluk protectorship of the holy places, an obligation conveying extraordinary esteem in the Muslim world. Every year the Sultan named an Amir al-Hajj from among his number one officials to lead the pilgrims and to go about as his agent in Mecca. At the top of the parade went the Mamel, a green, luxuriously adorned palanquin, representing the ruler's proper position. However, nobody rode inside it. The Amir al-Hajj was additionally positioned responsible for the Kiswa. This immense dark fabric was woven and recorded every year in Cairo and conveyed to Mecca to be hung over the Kaaba. Various authorities went with the Cairo and Damascus caravans to maintain control among the travelers and see to their special requirements. A portion of these administrators were Mamluks, others were instructed Arabs. They incorporated a Qadi, an Imam, a Muezzin, an intendant of intestate issues, a secretary to the Emir al Hajj, clinical officials, Arab guides, and a Mutalib, who police deals in profound public quality. On September 1, 1326, or it may have been the 10th, Ibn Battuta set out, now for the second time in four months, to fulfill the desire long cherished in his heart. The caravan's arranging ground was the town of al Kizwa, a couple of miles south of the city. Damascus' distance to Medina was around 820 miles, and the procession regularly canvassed it in 45 to 50 days. From Damascus, the path ran toward the south along the edge of the Syrian desert to the desert garden of Mon, situated on about a similar scope as Cairo. From that point, the course turned marginally southeastward, veering away from the Gulf of Aqaba and going through the inside high countries along the Hijaz Mountains' eastern flank. At Tabuk, the northern passage to Arabia, the band halted for a couple of days. The travelers refreshed and watered their camels prior to wandering into the savage place where there were naked mountains and huge, dark magma handle that lay among there in Medina. Ibn Battuta thought the northern Hijaz a fearsome wild, and for sure it was at any period of the year. He voyaged, he advises us, in the organization of a corps of Syrian Arab tribesmen, who may have been filling in as aides. He also made the association of various instructed voyagers such as himself, a Maliki legal advisor from Damascus and a Sufi from Granada whom he would meet again quite a while later in India. He likewise initiated a relationship with Medina's refined man, who made him his visitor during the band's four-day visit to that city. Medina, where the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, lectured, established the first Muslim state, and died in 632 was the most abundant of the little islands of richness dissipated along the inclines of the Hijaz Mountains, 
a green spot of residents existing in uncomfortable advantageous interaction with the Bedouin of the desert. The Mosque of the Prophet, which shielded the holy burial chamber just as those of his little girl Fatima and the Caliph Sabu Bekar and Jumar, became Al Haram, a position of sacredness. On the night of the very day that the caravan made camp outside the city, Ibn Battuta and his sidekicks went to the mosque, cheering at this most sign courtesy, lauding God Most High for our protected landing in the consecrated homes of his apostle. The safe haven was as an open court, encircled on all sides by corridors. At the southeast corner amid columns of marble columns stood the pentagonal burial chamber of Prophet Muhammad, and here Ibn Battuta fixed to supplicate and express appreciation. During the accompanying four days, he advises us in the Rila. We went through every night in the heavenly mosque, where everybody, engaged in devout exercises, a few, having shaped circles in the court and lit various candles, and with book rests in their middle, on which were put volumes, of the Holy Quran were recounting from it, some were articulating psalms of applause to God, others were involved in consideration of the Immaculatum, God incremented in pleasantness while on each side were vocalists reciting in commendation of the Apostle of God. During the days, Ibn Battuta without a doubt figured out how to visit different mosques, including the graveyard, al baqi east of the dividers that contained the graves of various family and companions of the Prophet. Ibn Battuta is likewise prone to have tried seeing the little domed burial chamber of Malik Ibn Anas, the incredible 8th century legal advisor and originator of the Maliki school of law. Ibn Battuta and his colleagues confronted 200 additional miles of blazing destination before arriving at the objective of their expectations. However, this last phase of the excursion was extraordinary, rundown travelers became celebrants, elevated and restored, and the entire dusty organization was changed into a euphoric, white robe parade. The change occurred at Duel Hale FA, a tiny settlement only five miles along the southward street out of Medina. This was one of the five stations, Mekots, on the five chief paths prompting Mecca, where pilgrims were needed to go into the condition of sanctification, called Iram. Here male explorers removed their voyaging garments, washed themselves, asked, lastly wore the extraordinary piece of clothing, likewise called Iram, which they would keep on wearing until after they entered the holy city and, on the off chance that it were the hour of the greater pilgrimage, played out the ceremonies of Hajj. The piece of clothing comprised of two huge, plain, unstitched sheets of white fabric, one of which was folded over the midsection, coming to the lower legs, the other accumulated around the upper piece of the body and hung over the left shoulder. Nothing was worn over or underneath the iron, and feet were left exposed or shod distinctly in shoes without impact points. Ladies didn't put on these pieces of clothing, however dressed modestly, covering their heads yet leaving their faces disclosed. When the pilgrims accepted the Iram, representing the correspondence of all men before God, he was needed to act in a way predictable with the condition of holiness into which he had intentionally entered. The Prophet warned, the pilgrimage is in months well known, whoso undertakes the duty of pilgrimage in them shall not go in to his womenfolk nor indulge in ungodliness and disputing in the pilgrimage. Whatsoever good you do, God knows it. After satisfying Iram's functions, the band put forward indeed, the travelers strolling straighter now and yelling God's gestures of recognition into the incomparable Arabian void. The course followed a southwesterly trail across low edges of the Hijaz slopes and afterwards down to the plain lining the Red Sea. The organization arrived at the coast at Rabiq, a station around 95 miles north of Jeddah where their courses from Syria and Egypt at long last joined and where the Egyptian explorers took the Iram. From here, the parade transformed into the desert once more, walking now southwestward along the beachfront plain. Likely seven days in the wake of leaving Rabig 6, they showed up in the first part of the day hours at Mecca's entryways, the mother of cities. It was mid-October 1326. Twenty-two years old and a year and four months, the pilgrim adventurer, Ibn Battuta, rode triumphantly into Mecca's narrow, brown valley and proceeded at once to the illustrious Holy House, reciting with his companions the prayer of submission to the Divine Will. What is thy command? I am here, O God. What is thy command? 
I am here. What is thy command? I am here. Thou art without companion. What is thy command? I am here. Among the cosmopolitan urban areas of Ibn Battuta's time, Mecca was in a single sense pre-prominent. From the finish of Ramadan and over time of Shawwal and Du al Qaeda, travelers from each Islamic land assembled in the city to supplicate in the sacred mosque, and, on the tenth day of the month Du al Hijjah, to remain in cooperation on the plain of Arafat before the Mount of Mercy. As Islam ventured into more far off Asia and Africa pieces during the Middle Period, the Hajj call accepted an always bigger and more assorted scope of people groups. In the ceremonies of the Kaaba's perambulations, the extraordinary stone 3D shape that remained in the mosque's focal point, Turks of Azerbaijan strolled with Malinke of Western Sudan Berbers of the Atlas with Indians of Gujarat. The fabulous mosque called the Haram, or Sanctuary, was the one spot on the planet where the disciples of the four primary legitimate schools, in addition to Shias, Zaydis, Ibadis, and different sectarians, implored together in one spot as indicated by their somewhat shifting ceremonial structures. Black Muslims and white Muslims, Sunnis and Shias all came to Mecca with the single proclaimed reason to satisfy a heavenly obligation and to venerate the One God. Whatever the pilgrim may have endured making progress toward Mecca, his own considerations were rapidly enough failed to remember as he entered the court of the Haram and remained before the incredible rock block encompassed in its dark cloak. The house Ibn Battuta stayed in was a Sufi hospice, he uses the term ribbit, called Al Muwafak, located near the mosque's southwestern side. He quickly struck up acquaintances with Elijah's pious residents in his usual fashion, some of them Maribus. The Meccans are elegant and clean in their dress, and as they mostly wear white, their garments always appear spotless and snowy. They use perfume freely, paint their eyes with cool, and constantly pick their teeth with slips of green eric wood. The Meccan women are of rare and surpassing beauty, pious and chaste. We can also be sure that Ibn Battuta spent the better part of his days and probably some of his nights in the Haram during these three weeks. He performed additional tofs always worthy in the sight of God, drank from the well, and made conversation with new acquaintances. After successfully completing pilgrimage obligations and claiming the title of Al-Hajjaj, the groups of Ijjis begin leaving for home, taking care to perform the Toph of farewell as their final ritual act. Ibn Battuta doesn't advise us in the Riley exactly when he concluded that he would not, for the present, get back to Morocco. At the point when he left Angier, his lone reason had been to arrive at the Holy House. Once there, in the Meccan marketplace, the fascinating countenances, the tales of bizarre sights and customs set his focus on some all-inclusive strategy for investigating the half of the globe? Was it there that he made his outlandish promise to meander the world while never remembering his means? Had he started to understand the prospects of voyaging a large number of miles toward each path from Mecca while never going past the restrictions of the recognizable society of men who shared his qualities, his propensities, and his language? Whatever spirit mixing impacts his first Hajj may have had on him, he was absolutely not, at this point the kid who stood sadly in the focal point of Tunis with no place to go and nobody to converse with. Following 18 months from home, he had just seen a greater amount of the world than the vast majority at any point would, he was developing a circle of learned and globally disapproved of companions, and he had won the title of Al-Hajj, itself an entree to regard among compelling and all-around voyaged individuals. At the point when he set off for Baghdad with the Iraqi travelers on 20 du al hajjah one truth was evident. He was done venturing out to satisfy a strict mission or even to arrive at a specific objective. He was going to Iraq essentially for its experience. It is now that his globetrotting vocation truly started. Thanks for watching episode 5 of our series of travels of Ibn Battuta. Stay tuned for the next episode, where we'll look into his journey through Persia's Mongolian rule. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe.